in a nutshell, in a hospital, you have two and a half days and three meal periods to inspire someone. And food is what everybody seriously looks forward to besides getting better and healing. All right, well, welcome to another episode of the Culinary 360 podcast where the Ignite Food Service chef team talks to chefs and different industry people. I'm Chef Robert. And I'm Chef Luke. And I'm Chef Ryan. Today, we've got a really great guest, um, Chef Jay-Z. When I say healthcare food, what do you think? Not awesome. Not great. (laughs) (laughs) So what we're going to do is delve into the change of healthcare food and how it's becoming sexy and it's something we want to eat and the sustainability of it. Jay-Z and I met a number of years ago through a uh, mutual friend. I was lucky enough to bump into Jay-Z again when the ACF uh, National Convention was here in Phoenix uh, this summer. Jay-Z works for uh, Morrison and they were doing a presentation on the changing face of healthcare food service. Big evolution, which Jay-Z can tell us some more about, but you know, uh, wonderful patient meals, um, an order system where they can get different types of food and um, also everything that they're doing out in the retail environment. But one of the greatest things that I saw during his presentation was the um, no texture meals. Basically, you know, we're helping to heal patients, not just with uh, all the medicine, but food is an integral part of that. So you know what? Let's let Chef Jay-Z tell us a little bit more about what's going on. Hey, Jay-Z, good to see you again. I don't need to say any more. You just said everything you possibly could say. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Jay-Z. Nice meeting you. Thank you. <laughs> go talk again the rest of the entire podcast. Here you go. This is I teed it up for you, Jay-Z. Go, run. Exactly. <laughs> I've only been involved with this for three years. I was a actually a vendor before this with In Harvest or Indian Harvest, as a lot of people used to know it, rice and whole grains. And that is actually where, if if you want to go back a little, my whole career changed. I I never thought I'd be selling rice back then in 2009. And it was a cool experience for realization of what food can do. So who knew 13 years later, I'd be working in healthcare. And now actually developing recipes. So there's a couple of sides to healthcare. There's the patient and retail, but all of it is our food. And that's really what attracted me to taking the job with Morrison. I'm more on the retail side and creating foods that you can come down to the cafe and enjoy while you might be visiting someone in the hospital or in the hospital. And something we noticed when we call it our food is that A certain percentage of people in the hospital, and it's a large percentage, don't need special diets. Mm -hmm. Yet in hospitals, they're feeding patients the special diet foods, even though they don't even need it necessarily. So that was something we touched on. And it's nice to know that if you wanted the Oklahoma smash burger, which is crazy and salt and all that stuff, but if you wanted that and you don't need to worry about your diet, you can order that now in your hospital room. You know, if you spend the night or whatever. In a nutshell, in a hospital, it was you have two and a half days and three meal periods to inspire someone with food. And food is what everybody seriously looks forward to besides getting better and healing. You're looking forward to that meal. You you feel that you, you know, you're sick or whatever. You just had an operation and you want to know what you got to eat. What, what can I eat? And to know that the food really does taste good and that it's tailored to a special diet if needed, and it really tastes good, that's really important to us. That's really cool. Um, So I'm guessing, Chef, that when you do your resource of bringing food in and everything like that, you're doing like free range and organic type food or things like that to kind of like keep an eye on those ingredients. As as much as we can. Yeah. It, it's, you know, I mean, you got 1100 hospitals nationwide, mm-hmm. so it's different everywhere. Sometimes availability is not there, but we try our hardest to do the best we can with the best products, the cleanest ingredients. That's something huge right now. Everybody reads labels. Yes. So we do too, you know, and what's in that. And if it's got 25 ingredients that you can't pronounce, do you really want to put that on a plate? <laughs> right. <laughs> We do so much with, you know, hospitals and other, you know, other types of, you know, call it retirement homes and things like that, assisted living. 
it's crazy. You're, you're right. I mean, the, the focus on, you know, improving these, these experiences. Uh, I actually went out to Portland for a startup training and, um, yeah, they were making all sorts of things that I was like, no, you can't be serving that in the hospital. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's yeah. got way too much something in it. Why can't you have good food, right? It, it, just because it's a hospital, you can have great food. And, and one of the concepts we're developing right now is chicken tenders, but we're hand breading them. Uh -huh. So we're not looking to buy in chicken tenders. We're going to hand bread those. And it's, it's insane because we'll be so busy because everybody loves chicken tenders. Yeah. But it's that process of going back to cooking as, as close as we can. And it really is. And that's how you get better food products. You know, you're feeding people better. Are you going to be air frying the chicken tenders then? You know, some accounts, so they're turbo chef, you never know, or whatever it might be, the piece of equipment you're using. Obviously, some people have deep fryers. So there's nothing okay. wrong with deep fried food. Just don't eat it every day. Right. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, are you kidding me? Friday, what is it? Uh, one of the days, Thursday usually is fried chicken day. It's probably the busiest day in the cafes in all <laughs> hospitals. So, and, yeah. and these are doctors and nurses coming down <laughs> eating fried chicken. But again, it's not every day. Everybody loves fried chicken, right? Oh, everybody loves fried chicken. <laughs> so when my, my first child was born, I mean, I can remember, you know, I stayed on the little couch in, in the room with my wife. I ate there, I think, one meal. Um, and, I mean, this was a little while ago. It wasn't, it wasn't anything to write home about. Um, after that, I was sort of like kind of outsourcing my meals <laughs> a little bit. Like my brother would come to visit and he'd bring me something or my sister-in-law or something like that. Same for my wife. That's another thing that drew me to wanting to work with Morrison is that I was in a cab one time driving and I had just gotten the job and I was so glad I took the job and I was so proud and I'm sitting in the cab and I'm wearing a chef coat because I wear it everywhere I go. And the cab driver turns around and says, hey, where do you work? What restaurant are you at? I said, oh, I'm not at a restaurant. I, I work in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry, dude. That was so <laughs> And I'm like, no, it's, it's, you don't yeah. understand. Like the food is changing. It's, it's cause hospital food gets a bad rap. Right. So I'm glad to be on the forefront with that and really changing what hospital food can really be and what it is. And that's what you saw in our presentation, Rob. Definitely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And it's not just the food. It's the way it is pre presented because we eat with our eyes first and then, you know, you back it up with your tongue and, uh, you, you, know. you got your phone out <laughs> and take a picture of that. If you're not taking a picture, it, yeah, it's the first thing you do. Instagram your uh, room service tray. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> and people do that. It's so cool. It's so cool That's when someone does awesome. that. So I know you and your team, Jay-Z, write these menus and you're, you're reimagining, you know, healthcare food service. How are, are you getting inspiration from the patients, from the doctors, from the staff, from the the families that come to visit are are they giving input and sending you in directions to kind of like you know okay well we thought we were gonna we're writing a menu this way and oh you know that's a great idea i hadn't thought of that or you know and does that take you in another direction how how does that additional feedback fit in so yes <laughs> we look at everything um we create a lot of the concepts that are launched at, at all our hospitals okay as a team as long as you're running your concepts and doing what you need to be doing, you're more than welcome to do something extra. That's what we tell our chefs. It gives that creative side to come out. This way, chefs are wanting to still like their job. So if you have someone, especially another employee who's got some, I don't know, great Latin salsa, go throw that salsa out there. Call it Rico's salsa. Call it whatever you want to call it and really create that. So if there's people asking for something like doctor or something like that, of course, we're going to, if we can do it, we'll get it. Obviously, we'll be able to source it. But that's definitely, um, you can't just go out and buy something at the supermarket and come back and cook it. You have to go to the proper channels. But you definitely can be creative. And we look at everything from magazines to TikTok. I, when, dis when disruptors come around, uh -huh. I had to design a whole program on disruptors. You know, the <laughs> Hasselback potato and then the, yeah, yeah. the quesadilla you fold it over four times and, and made it into a sandwich. Uh -huh. All those things that come and go we try them out because that's how people eat anyway. They're all eating uh -huh. from their phone. Oh, I want that. And you're yeah. like, all right, cool. <laughs> so yeah. So yes, we do a lot of research. Obviously we look at a lot of trend uh, websites. Data essentials is big. There's a lot of places we go to, to see what trends are out there and how they're trending. And that helps us want a menu better as well. I think that's really cool that you have that ability to just kind of whip up menus like that throughout the week. 
It's, it's I wouldn't say I wouldn't say a menu. It might be it might be a station or something like that, but yeah. Okay. And not every hospital can do it. We welcome it. We don't want it done every day, you know, because that's why we have our programs to keep everything standardized, you know, when you're a big company, that's what you have to do. But definitely welcome chefs being creative if they can. I mean, I don't expect foie gras being served with truffles, but just try to, if you got someone asking for something, especially doctor's lounges, that's another one. We do a lot of catering. Uh huh. And if you have a doctor that requests something, there are some really great things that I see on Facebook and LinkedIn from our chefs that are doing some amazing foods from little, little like squeeze bottles and droppers and things you would never see in a hospital, but you see it at the catering events for our doctors and things. Those chefs are probably, you know, their, their, their amount of buy-in at that point, right? Like they're, they are in, right? And they love their job. They love doing it. And the people around them probably are loving being around them doing it. You know, I, it's always nice to be in a situation like that. Oh, yeah, it is. It's really nice. And again, it's not like that every single hospital, but there are many that are, that are really, really great and have a great, the great way they serve the food is, is awesome. And everybody's happy. Yeah. When you were talking about if somebody's like from another culture and want to put that item on, um, that, reminded me, I've got a uh, district here, a school district here in Phoenix, and the district does a team building meeting once a year in my kitchen. And um, five of the schools, and I think there's eight schools, it's um, uh, K through, it's a K through eight um, district. And they will do a special menu item that they do only at their school that they're allowed to supplement the menu with. And it's usually a uh, catered to the demographic of that neighborhood that goes to that school. And these ladies that come in here, I mean, so the food is just, it's like, wow, that's not, that's not school food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many different ethnic segments being catered to that way from this program. And it's also a huge team building thing and morale building thing that, Hey, my district likes me. They listen to me. They help me, you know, it's, and you know, I mean, Working in healthcare food service, working in K-12 food service, it ain't an easy job. No, nope. I don't think any, any job in the food service hospitality industry is easy. You have to always be on. You have to always be ready to go. You, it's stressful. But if mm -hmm. you balance everything out right, I think is huge. And eat right. I, I said that in the beginning. What you eat is how you feel. If you're eating crappy food, fried chicken every single day. It's going to take a toll on you, right. you know, and then you're not getting enough sleep and then you, you you're not going to be a happy chef. Yeah, I think you had said too that you guys do something like maybe a menu card type thing that's posted for the associate that's um, serving the guest so that if the guest comes up and asks a question about it, they can articulate what's in the dish and sell that and upsell that dish or, you know, encourage that person to, to try that. I'm so happy with marketing and love what they're doing because it really is true. You know, you can be the best chef in the world, throw together this amazing meal. But you got a crappy server that comes to the table mm -hmm. and they're just like, I don't know, it's birdseed and it's supposed to be quinoa, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> all in the way it's described. <laughs> so the same works for the, the patient side and the retail side. If you have someone serving food and someone says, what is that? Or how's your salmon today? And you know, as a chef that that just came fresh from one of the seafood vendors that it's amazing. And the guy's like, I don't know, I don't eat salmon. <laughs> and it just ruins the whole moment. And same with right. patient food. If they come in saying, oh, you got to try this Coca-Cola braised short rib. It's got this amazing creamy polenta and this broccolini. They threw some garlic on it. Boom. Everybody's going to eat that now. Mm -hmm. As opposed to some beef stuff. You want it? It's got some creamy <laughs> stuff. I don't know. It's like yellow. It looks like grits. Yeah. Like pot roast. You know, so... It's about creating that that vibe in the hospitals and really teaching. Teaching is really important and making sure that everybody's on the same page. So we mm -hmm. try to do pre-shift. We try to do a post-shift after different things in our hospitals. We definitely want to sell the product. And like I was saying, if it's if it's quinoa, know it's quinoa. Know it's the complete protein whole grain. Know it, it's similar to a rice, not birdseed. Right. And I think that's really important. So we try to do a lot of those trainings and those are all posted a lot of different places and again, utilizing the phone is huge for QR codes mm. and different things that associates can now pull up on their phone and say, hey, what is quinoa? Oh, well, quinoa is originally from Bolivia, South America, wherever it might be. Yeah. And that gives us that quick story. 
We start, try to stay within a minute to a two minutes of teaching when you're looking at QR codes as well. And that just helps people understand and want to want to know the food and then right. want to go sell the food. I'll tell you a quick story. I was down in, oh, down in Atlanta somewhere in Georgia. I was at one of our accounts and I was learning. I was doing a day in the life and I was blown away by the patient line. And when they plated the food and I've worked a lot of places in my career. And one of the most amazing places I worked was the Ritz Carlton Hotel in Naples and watching the CMC chef Lawrence McFadden basically orchestrate what was happening when we plated a 700 meal. And the only thing you heard in the kitchen was asparagus and asparagus dropped. Steaks and steaks dropped. And that's all you heard in the kitchen. And you didn't even hear the plates moving or anything. It was so quiet. Same thing in this hospital. I was blown away. All you heard was asparagus and the asparagus came out or, or need eggs and eggs came out. And it was just amazing how they orchestrated this. And the servers rotated around. They actually plated their meal and then went around, grabbed their stuff and then pushed it up to the, uh, to the floor they were on. So it was a, this process of owning it, not just here's the chef, they plate it, they throw it in the box, the box goes up and then the server just gives you the food and they don't even look at it. Right. This was plated by the servers, which was really cool. They, they call them patient service managers and patient services individuals. It was just really, really cool to see that. And to know that that was a hospital, Yeah. it's the care of food, man. And that's, that's what's going to change the whole world and what we're doing and believing in. And it's going to get you better. Not that I want to keep people out of the hospital because we need people to come into the hospital so we keep our jobs, <laughs> but we want to make sure that we, uh, you enjoy your, your experience in a hospital. That's cool that the serving staff had like the same knowledge as the kitchen. Yeah. Like they're just kind of like front of, front of the house expos pretty much. Right. Each one of them, right? And they cared. They didn't just slop it on the plate like real quick. It was, it was, it was plated like the picture that was hanging, uh -huh. you know, and, and that's what we strive for. And they, they were very, they were proud to plate the food. And I think that's cool that the chefs prepared. It was really great. That's rad. And I think that can go like a lot of ways of saying with in the industry, it's like there are people cooking the food and they take real good pride in that, but you should take pride in serving the food too, of how it looks and not just yeah. sloppiness. Cause mm -hmm. like, if, like we always talk about people see food with their eyes before they eat it. And if that server or that, that hospitality front of the house has that, care for and showing that to that person it's just going to make it more enjoyable for that person eating the food Absolutely. that reminds me like there's a you come across a couple restaurants at least i have in my life where you know you have front of the house staff back of the house staff but then they rotate right you have servers that you know maybe next week they're actually the grill cook right and then the week after that they're you know bussing tables and then the week after that they're maybe the dishwasher or something i don't know everybody works through the kitchen and i know like like just on the surface, it seems like it would be hard to find people that would be either a willing to do it or would want to do it just because you got to have, you know, more skills to do it. But I think everybody's so bought into it, you know, that you, you can't do it unless, unless you're really digging it. Right. And I think <clears throat> that just reminded me of that. I, I think how, how special that probably is for that team there to be able to have that feeling. Like even the cooks probably watching them do that, you know, they, they feel like you know the work that they're doing means even more, right? And so everybody's exactly. kind of patting each other's backs while they're while they're working. That's awesome. It was really cool. I wish there were more. And again, not every hospital is like that, but and not every restaurant is like that for that matter. I mean, it's just it's just it's people, but it is creating that environment. And I think that's really that's the future, creating great environments, which I think we're on a way. One of the things we talk about at Morrison is we menu with intention. So we're menuing items that make sense. And one of the things I'm teaching my daughter at home is we're not eating a tomato mozzarella salad in December. I'm sorry. Tomatoes <laughs> aren't that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cardboard and mozzarella sandwich. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And plus the texture, the textures are wrong. It's cold. It's, there's a whole lot of reasons why we don't do that. Society, general, gen pop, as I like to call it. Sorry, everybody. But gen pop doesn't understand that. My mom and dad didn't know that. They didn't grow up in the industry like us. But we have, I feel we have an obligation as chefs to, to start and teach that and bring that to life even more so. I, I'm a huge believer in what you teach. You know, I do a program to kids teaching about eating fruits and vegetables. And there are so many kids that say, ew, gross, yuck. Mm -hmm. But if you make it fun and you give them a little sample of something, mm -hmm. you know, we do a smoothie. It's got, 
It's got strawberries, bananas, blueberries, and beets. And then we flavor it with honey. And I tell them about balancing as a chef. You balance. It's like science. And you want to make sure the taste of the beet is the same with the honey. And they balance it in and they taste delicious. And then everybody tries it. I make them all... I make them all hold this little shot glass. I'm doing shots with kids, I know, but <laughs> I'm holding this shot glass of stuff. And I say, don't taste it. Don't smell it. Everybody just hold it, hold it, hold it. And it's all like elementary school kids, right? So usually like fifth grader or younger. And I'm making them hold this cup. And okay, on the count of three, once everybody gets it, one, two, three, everybody go. Because all it takes is that one kid that uh-huh. tastes it before anybody else. And uh-huh. they go, oh, yuck. It's ruined. Yep. 25 people don't even try it. Oh, ruined. Yep. We it's been it's been a cool thing and, and I, I love those programs with kids. So the kids you they're they're sponges. You can mold a child any way you want when it comes to food, and it, it's just you got to you got to let them try stuff. Yeah, and then taking that a step further, you know, educating people with what is raw taste like versus cooked. What is like Brussels sprouts are a perfect example. People say I hate Brussels sprouts until they have them roasted, and even. You don't even have to put the balsamic and the meat and the pork with it and all that stuff. Just, just roast the Brussels sprout instead of boiling it. And it's a thousand times better. And then, you know, now you learned how to walk. Now you can learn how to run. And what else, what are you going to do to it next? Yeah, that's right. The, the whole cooking something right. The whole reason I got into cooking was my grandma. My mom, my mom cooked once in a while. I was a latchkey kid. I came home. I let myself in, you know, the key was on top of the light. I'd pull it down and put the key back on top of the light outside. And I'd come in and mom would have like a chicken in the fridge and some seasoning on the counter. And I'd have to season and put the chicken in and she'd come home and take it out. So I did basic, basic cooking. But the day my grandmother came over and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? After I graduated high school, I was like, I don't know, grandma. I said, just graduated high school. I'm having a blast now. I'm going to party. <laughs> so I told, I, you know, I made a tuna fish sandwich, a basic tuna sandwich. And I threw in some breadcrumb in there. I threw some celery and this mayonnaise, simple ingredients. And my grandmother goes, this is a great tuna sandwich. You should go to cook school. So I went to cook school. And then when I did that, I realized that food, when it tastes good and you make people happy with food, it's such a rewarding experience. So yeah, I, I needed to share that because it was like, that's what got me into food and wanting to do it more. Some history stuff I'm interested in too, but more so making someone happy and trying something they may never have had before, like asparagus, like Brussels sprouts. You know, Some people, I don't like asparagus. Well, grill them. Don't boil them. Just like you said, don't eat canned, that's for sure. Not that I'm bashing canned food, but canned asparagus are not as good as fresh on the grill. But So you mentioned um, you know, working with kids and teaching kids and, and that you do some of these uh, you know, I don't know, classes or seminars and things. Maybe, maybe talk about that a little bit more. I, I, that's something, at least for me personally, something that I find, oh, nice. Something very, very fulfilling. Tommy Tomato. So it's called Five a Day the Colorway. Uh-huh. And so what happened was, I, uh, and I'll be quick on this, I won't be too long, but I went into schools and right away when you go into a school and you're a chef, they think you're going to change the food. And they're like, whoa, whoa, dude, we, <laughs> we can't do you. We can't do that. No, no, you can't be uh-huh. in here. So I had to find a way that I wasn't bringing in a, a, a burner and food and teaching and feeding kids. So I said, what about product identification? And there was another chef local here in Charlotte that came around and he's like, Jay-Z, I got this program. You want to try it? And I went to this program that he did and it was very, very cool, very, very simple. Like he had an apple, a banana, he had a piece of cauliflower and he just talked about those three things and he had those characters well, we've mm-hmm. morphed that since 2012 here in Charlotte through the ACF, and we call it five a day of the colorway, portion size, size of my fist. And we say that line a thousand times. So we'll be talking, and this is an avocado, and this is an orange, and this is check it out, and look at this. And oh, and five a day of the colorway, repeat after me, five a day of the colorway. And then the kids repeat it, portion size, size of my fist. And it just goes on and on for about 35 minutes. And by the end of that time, I say to the kids, hey, what's the saying? Repeat after me. One, two, three, go. And I don't say it. And they all say it. And it's just Mm -hmm. a cool feeling. And I teach them, just try a piece of fruit and vegetable, any different color, five Mm -hmm. portions every day, portion size, size of their fist. And for someone who's um, under age, I think it was 14 or 13 or 14, I think it is, it's the portion size, size of your fist. 
And then for fun, I tell, and all the adults in the room, it's two fists, but that's besides the point. Um, <laughs> it's not, but, but I just, you know, I just try to teach the kids to really want to try something. You know, if you've never had a strawberry before, and you know, of course you get the kids, well, I'm allergic. Well, listen, you know, I get it, but mm-hmm. try different things and you never know what, what could come out of that or where you're going to go. And it, I talk about cauliflower, grill it like a steak. And throw mm-hmm. on like a pesto or throw on a marinara sauce and melt some cheese on it and make like cauliflower parm, parmesan. And they go, oh, I never thought of that. You know, these little kids and they, they, they love that. So, yeah, I love the programs. It's pretty cool. That, that sounds so awesome. How? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go further. Um, go <laughs> you, got, you, got, now, you, you got me going now. Um, so it, you, you do this with the ACF. How do you get in front of the schools? How do the, do the schools come to you? Do they are they petitioning for this program? Mm-hmm. How how does it work? <laughs> Networking. I, I you know we the reason that I am in ACF besides certification and is networking. That's how I met you. That's how I meet people. Now I met you guys. It's all about the networking. So in schools, what we did was you knew you knew you know a chef that knows a chef. You know, mm-hmm. our, our mutual friend, mm-hmm. you said in the beginning of this conversation, I can say his name, right? Chucky. I'm allowed yeah. to say his yeah. name, right? Yeah, Chuck. yeah, yeah. Chucky, he was a vendor. He put equipment into schools. Well, Chucky and I connected and he got me to know the principal because he was in there. So the principal says, hey, and Chucky, you know, his personality, you go in and he's like, hey, we got this program. Do you mind showing it to some kids and or a teacher that you might know? And I'll be talking just like I did now. I described the program. And you know what? Ryan's also a fourth grade teacher on the side. Well, Jay-Z, bring that program to my class. And it just morphed into this big thing in Charlotte. I've probably been in about a 100 of the elementary schools since 2012. Uh-huh. Word uh-huh. gets out and you network some more. There's actually an organization that builds outdoor learning kitchens. or outdoor, Sorry, I always say that. Outdoor learning environments for kids. They're called OutTeach in Charlotte. And they're actually in Texas too, I believe. But they build these outdoor learning centers for the kids and they're evolved around gardens. So the kids go and they plant stuff in the garden. Well, I I said, hello, Edna, we got to connect. I got this program. I'll introduce the the vegetables that you're growing, you know, whatever. And I'll talk about Mm -hmm. those and the kids will get excited. So networking through it has connected our organization here in Charlotte to certain schools. There are still some schools that look and say, no, we don't want you in here. But the ones you get in, the kids remember. And it's so cool when you go into a, a second grade class and then leave the school, go somewhere else, go somewhere else, go somewhere else, come back like three years later. And now those second graders are in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. And one kid goes, hey, Chef Jay-Z, five a day, right? And it's like, no way, dude. I <laughs> yeah, you there it is. <laughs> that, awesome. And that's, that's the rewarding side of it. Uh, but yeah, so I, and the characters, I only have two here, but you saw Tommy, uh, there's Bobby Broccoli, here's Claudia Cauliflower, you know, and it's just having fun and really, you get diverse, you get diverse with it and you can do multiple different things. I'll bring in all these different peppers and I'll have an orange, I'll have a green, I'll have a red, I'll have a yellow. And I'll be like, do you think there's a purple pepper? And the kids would be like, no. And then you pull out a purple pepper. And now you talk about seasonality because you can't grow a purple pepper all year round. It only grows at a certain time. So those things, I tie them all in and you just read the crowd. And that's kind of what we did with that program. And you read the crowd and what you do. We've got about, we have a handful of chefs here in Charlotte that do the program. It does take personality because every class is different. Mm -hmm. You talk to a fifth grader, different than an elementary school kid, uh, like a first grader. I've done it in high schools, but those kids don't care. So (laughs) middle school is usually where I stop and draw the line for it. But Mm -hmm. I've done it at daycares, churches. uh, It's a lot of fun when you grow this program. And I've mentioned the ACF before, but I never had the – I need more backing basically. And it'll it'll get out there some more. It's such an easy program to do where you're just doing product identification with kids. I spent about 75 bucks in groceries. I can send you the PDFs of the, the characters and boom, there you go. Oh, we are so in. Yeah. We are so into this. <laughs> I love that. Cool. And I think of, Luke would be awesome with this because, I mean, he's just, he's so awesome with kids. Um, you know, I mean, he, well, he was going to be, his, he comes from teachers and, mm-hmm. you know, and 
<laughs> you were playground playground monitor or something like that, right? <laughs> when I when I first moved to Colorado, I I was working at a fine dining restaurant at night, but during the day I was a I was a a para pro for a kindergarten class, and so I would oh. go in, I would help out, you know, I'd make copies of things for the teachers. I was one of the only like you know males in the building. Play dodgeball, but I I play from my knees. I, we could only play with like little foam balls. Uh, all you got involved. Yeah. You got yeah, involved. Yeah. It was a blast. That's, that's all you got to do. Luke, you could morph it into, you can cook for them. You can uh-huh. have them cooking with you. I just do a simple little product identification. It gets you in the door and then you take it from there. Smoothie is my best thing. I actually bring my blender yeah. in nice. and I throw the ingredients <laughs> into it. I have it already made, but then I blend it right in front of them as I'm throwing it in there and they're like, oh my goodness, ew, because I'm throwing beets <laughs> and spinach. <laughs> but yeah, it's That's fun. pretty awesome. I just mm-hmm. did a, well, not just, it's a couple months ago, but the Colorado School Nutrition Association, they're, they're uh, summer conference. <clears throat> I did a smoothie demo, but I mean, I'm using a, a giant submersible blender and stuff though. I still think that that could be pretty fun for the kids too, though. Oh yeah. <laughs> anything, anything giant motors. Any, right. oh, yeah. It really could be fun. <laughs> Loud noises and, and kitchen, kitchen equipment. <laughs> oh, that's fun. I love, I love this idea. This is really cool. It's been successful, you know, and it's so rewarding. Nothing beats when you have a kid that never ate a beat before right. and said, I like beats. You yeah. I'm like, yeah, kid. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely gonna have to talk more about this and uh start figuring out how to how to get this through our through the western half of this country that we are ba- are based in. I'll send you everything I got. Just run it through ACF if you don't mind. That's all that's yeah. all I do ask. Because it is yeah. a it is a chef and child or move to schools kind of right. thing. Yeah. Um I'm a big believer in that. That's why I do it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there it is. Move to schools on this arm. Move uh-huh. to schools right there. So, uh, um, my ACF coat. Love it. <laughs> proud member. <laughs> All politics aside, proud member. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> so, Jay-Z, I know you, you're deal- you deal with a lot of different um, kitchens. You're developing all this different food. Um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing coming down the road, not just in food, but are you seeing different equipment trends? Because I, you know, um, we're always hearing about automation. We're always hearing about the mm. tight labor market. We're hearing about, you know, what you have to pay cooks and everybody's got to work on margins and everybody's got to hit, hit targets. Um, you know, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing both from the food side and the equipment side, you know, um, that that's going to be more prevalent in one, three, five years, whatever. I see a lot of quick cooking stuff. You know, the, the, it's called an air fryer, but really like Alton Brown says, you're, it's just a little mini convection oven, but mm-hmm. you know, that quick cook, how fast can something get done? It convenience, which yeah. sometimes isn't always convenient, but convenience is a big trend that's happening on the food side. Again, we menu with intention. So we menu five ingredients or less. We try to, in a lot of our recipes. So keeping it easier for staff to compose something, not having, you know, a classic, 87 recipe thing. We're not making mole every day, you know, so mm-hmm. we'll source cleaner label pre-made mole maybe, or something from a company or, or whatever it might be. We're trying to source things through uh, the story. The story is so, so important. And I think the story with anything to the, f- to the, to the equipment, the story on the equipment, how and why it's there and what it does or the family that created it or whatever. What did I just see? Uh, uh, and again, sorry, if you don't wrap this one, but more, Marforno pizza oven. Uh-huh. I don't know how to say it. I apologize, but I just saw that oven. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty close. Yeah, it's just unbelievable piece of equipment. You know, a wood stone oven. When I when I worked for Schwann's, I helped open a restaurant, and I got to pick a wood stone oven that I wanted in there, just to learn how to work on that. Yeah, and the surface of it, and how it rotates, and what it does. And now I heard that there's an oven out there like that now that actually rotates for you. Yeah, it, I'm like. It goes around. How great is that? And right? it's got it's got five heat sources underneath the rotator, <laughs> and one that finishes the pie, and one that cooks from the center. So it's like, you know, you got a minute and a half pie coming coming around. That's going to be pretty trendy when you get people who don't want to wait for their stuff because the impinging oven is still pushing that through really, really slow moving when you can cook it in a minute. Or- yeah, that, that's kind of what I look at is automation for the industry is, you know, it's not it's not that burger flipping robot arm that I've seen. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, OK, I can drop a pie. I could build another pie 
and the pie yep. comes around and I can take it out. That's that's automation. Or I stick a probe in something and it does what and the oven knows what to do. And people seeing people create too. That that whole the idea of the open kitchen, I'm not saying the open kitchen is going to be trendy, but the idea of someone finishing something in front of you, seeing them, seeing, watching them, watching you make that pie yeah. and then cooking in a minute, I think is a big, that that's also a big trend that's happening. People want to see their yeah. food a little more, want to know what's in their food as opposed to just something coming out of the kitchen. It becomes a value add. So you can actually charge a premium for that mm-hmm. because they're seeing that it is being made by hand Correct. by a person. Yep. They're not cut, they're not pulling it out of the freezer and yeah. So we're getting back to cooking is another trend. Getting back to actually cooking is, is something I see. Okay. But the convenience side of it folded in. Um I would say that social media is a trend. I mean it makes or yep. breaks you now you know that and you can really who knows where this podcast is going to go. It's either going to make or break me. Who knows? I mean but <laughs> social media <laughs> Sorry, we off, off the, but technology is a big thing that we're looking at. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. people look at a menu right now. I was out the other night. I forget the word, but someone asked me, hey, what's this mean on the menu, Jay? And I said, I'm not sure. And we looked it up and boom, you mm-hmm. can immediately get what it is find before stuff. you. Yeah. Yeah. You can find stuff so much faster now. So social media changes. Just like I heard something the other day on the news about fashion, you know, tight jeans are in again. I'm like, yes. Cause I got some tight <laughs> jeans, but, but like baggy jeans are out or it's just, and they were just in the other day and now they're gone again. So I think trends are going to go faster, which is going to make it harder for companies to keep up. I feel with, with mm-hmm. the needs of things mm-hmm. So we're going to yeah. have to really look at, and I say, focus on just cooking for food wise. It's focus on your cooking, focus on what's going on. People always love to watch a chef, always love yeah. to watch someone right. making food. They're intrigued by it. All my friends, whenever we go out, what are you cooking tonight, Jay-Z? They all want to know, what's, what are you making? So it's that, that, that moment that you have to bank off of that. Not how fast can I make it, but maybe like teach them. And that's all, I'll go back to the beginning of our conversation where we have the power to teach people that fresh mozzarella and tomato and basil is the time to eat it right now. Figs, you better be eating figs all day long right now because they are around, they're in season. Here's a great way to do it. Just drizzle some, put them on the grill real quick, put some salt on there, drizzle some honey, some goat cheese, eat it. And I think that's a huge direction for teaching as a chef to keep up with all the trends that are changing. Just you do your own thing, but do it right. Mm -hmm. So cooking with integrity, menu with integrity, Five ingredients to last. Let's do it. There you go. Did I get enough trends in there for you? And I'm sure that you're looking for cooking equipment that gets the food out faster than a regular type of old equipment. It depends on the location, but yeah, absolutely. Right. You got a fast casual place. That food better not be taking, you know, the ticket times. You better know your ticket times, you know? And Mm -hmm. I agree that the equipment's really important. What did I just work on the other day? An oven that had like three different zones and one zone was like 400 degrees, one zone was 200 degrees, and one zone was something else. And each one cooked mm-hmm. something different. Mm-hmm. So I can bake cookies with salmon and steaks and nothing tastes like the other. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I think I might know that oven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was neat to see those things. Again, that's going to take some training for chefs. How, how do you incorporate that now? Mm-hmm. How do you incorporate it into your menu? Because that's going to yeah, change yeah. cook times. Because right now we have all these recipes written. Where, you know, chicken 350 for 25 minutes or whatever it is. So now you're talking this new oven, it only takes 12 minutes or whatever it is. So we got to rethink how we uh, write recipes and all that. But I I can't wait to see what the future brings from equipment to food. It's going to be great. I think a lot of times, a lot of times now when I have conversations with other chefs that are, you know, looking into a piece of equipment or looking into a whole suite of equipment, you know, a lot of times the first question is, what's your priority? Is it? time is it quality you know obviously you want to balance those two things but like which one, one of them has to kind of weigh more than the other in at least mm-hmm. your that specific operation you know if you ask any chef obviously quality is going to be you know if not the most important thing it well it probably should be um but sometimes the operation itself you know you need to be able to bust things out faster right and and that yeah. becomes the higher priority for that specific customer and and so it, you know, it's cra- It is crazy to me some of the things that we see. Like the Robert hinted at, you know, one of the one of the ovens that we represent now, it does some pretty amazing things. 
um, and fast. It's super fast, right? So, and you you say fast. Uh, I had this discussion yesterday with a senior living um, group that was in my kitchen, and we were talking about they've got a they've got such a captive audience, and these people are very demanding because they've paid a lot of money to live there. And it's basically, you know, it's it's a country club for people over 55. They've got multiple feeding venues and sometimes they want to just sit down and dine. Sometimes they just need something fast. And I would. And so, you know, they were looking at speed cook ovens and it may fit into what they're doing. But I'm like, did you ever think about implementing cook chill into the back kitchen? Because they're going through a huge remodel. And I'm like, you know, we can par cook some stuff, blast chill it send it out to the retail locations. And being that it's par cooked, I can heat it up even faster than hitting it with, uh, with, you know, radio frequency or microwave or whatever. I mean, I can bring that back even quicker because I've now par cooked that. Plus, you know, now, you know, we can get into thing, you know, the five day shelf life. If we, you know, do other steps, we can extend that. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can do. And they're like, no, we hadn't even thought about that. Cook chill sounds like it's slower and you've got to touch it a lot of times. It may get to you to the final end game quicker. It's got to be able to clean too. I mentioned that to you, Luca. You got to be able to clean this oh, yeah. easy too. That's mm-hmm. equipment, all these fan dangle things and not break down. You know, that's yeah. another thing we look at too. You know, when you, you get this fancy, beautiful Mercedes Benz of a piece of equipment, but it's got all these programs yet you can't turn the damn thing on. So that's, that's always important too, the training of it and learning how to use the equipment the proper way. You know, there's still still chefs out there that have no idea how to use a combi oven. They keep it on convection all the time. (laughs) I'm like, no, it's a combi. Why aren't you utilizing that to its full potential? Right. And they're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. No one's ever showed me. So it's just, and that's few and rare, but it's, that's important stuff. So. And with the labor force out there right now is being able to teach people fast and efficiently how to cook the food with the type of equipment you have. Correct. Yeah. Come out with all this awesome technology, but like you said, if you can't run it or turn it on, then what's the point? <laughs> yep. What 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 do we have to look forward to as equipment wise from your side? Is there anything you're seeing for new innovation coming up? Is this something that I can look forward to in the future for cooking with? You know, a lot of the things that you were talking about, like the focus on food, you know getting cooking back into some of these places, right? Whether it's the hospitals or um, healthcare, schools, all of that, right? I think Mm -hmm. we see the manufacturing kind of community recognizing that as well. And so I think we see, yes, you know, there's, there's been an emphasis on speed and like, how do we get things done faster and so forth. But then simultaneously, I feel like a lot of the manufacturers are also trying to find ways to you know, make it, make high quality more consistently easy. Mm-hmm. And whether that's through, you know, like, like Robert was saying, not, not robotics, but through automation of some of the equipment. So that rotating oven and, and, you know, this, this basically like a modification to, you know, the traditional speed ovens, you know, and utilizing different types of technology that allow you to do these things faster at higher quality levels. So I, I think that at least, on, on our end of it, <clears throat> I think that's a, you know, pretty common trend and, and what we see what's happening. So, okay. And then, you know, another really big thing right now out in, um, the industry is ventless cooking. A yeah. lot of people are looking for more, not spending a bunch of money on hoods and how they can get as good as food out, but still quick enough without a fryer and things like that. Um, so ventless cooking is really big. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's definitely a big one. Jay Z, I think you probably were using one of the ovens that we sell. It's called a Vector. Um, that's the one that had the three different uh, oven temperatures at the same time. Yes, it's called a Vector. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then there's like this um, braising pan on steroids that's that's been out for a little while, and those can actually have zone heating. So and programmability like the combis do, so that you could be like searing on one side of the pan and letting things rest on the other side of the pan. So like, let's say you're going to make short ribs. You're searing on one side, and then you're transitioning that over to the other side to stay warm. Then you start your mirepoix. 
then the oven knows or the braising pan knows to change to a different temperature because now you're going to add your wine and do your reduction. So it goes to that temperature. After that, it knows that you're going to be adding your stock and it needs to bring it up to a boil and that it needs to cook it at a simmer for X number of, you know, for whatever, 90 minutes, whatever you program into there. Right. And then it will actually go into like a hold mode and just keep it at a food safe temperature until you remove the product. Mm -hmm. And then you hit the clean function and it actually dumps water into there. You can clean it. There's a drain and it drains it all out. Oh, wow. And all this can be programmed right into the unit. When even the heat style, like whether it's just on the bottom. So like, like Robert's talking about, it could be you're just, just searing on the bottom. And so all the energy is being focused onto those parts, right? Just the, the, the surface of it, right? But then, you know, when you start to actually braise or you need to reduce your, pro or reduce your liquids, um, you know, that heat is then now brought up along the sides of the pans as well. And it, we're in, in the beginning part, you know, it's just focused on one, one element, but now it's all, well, all the way around the sides, like a, you know, steam jacket kettle or something like that. But being able to control the, the location of where the heat's coming from even. That's huge. Yeah. You know, do I have time for one more little story? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we just had an ACF meetup. We call them meetups, not meetings. Cause who wants to go to the meeting? So at our ACF <laughs> meetup locally, we just did a, a foodie fight, we called it. And it was a cutthroat foodie fight. So we had three different chefs. They were both on this. They were different teams. So it was six chefs total, three on a team. They had no idea what their cutthroats were going to be. So it was held at our, uh, our natural gas facility here in Charlotte, Piedmont Natural Gas, it's called. They have all gas operating equipment. So they had a giant oven, uh, like the one behind you, the pizza oven. They had two different combis from two different companies. They had a fryer. They had a range. They had a flat top and all these different things that they had to work on. So as the competition is going, point of my whole story is we cut the power and we said, hey, power just went out. Well, they had stuff in the combi and the combi doesn't work anymore now because it's electric as well as gas uh -huh. and it didn't work. So what do you do? And it was amazing to see the chefs think on their fly on the fly there, you know, think on the fly what to do with, well, I was going to fry that. Now what am I going to do? So they quickly uh -huh. threw something into the wood stone that was there or the, the, the pizza oven. And they, they didn't open the door to the, the combi because it had enough heat in there to finish cooking the biscuits they were making. And it, so it was just interesting to see teaching, you know, go up and don't just push a button anymore. Like that's cool, convenient, but I hope you know what to do if the button doesn't work. Yeah. Yep. I think that's a big thing as, as equipment comes out and gets fancier and really, really shiny that the chefs still understand how to cook. Even if the button, because you know, the button, it's electronics, everything works. Look at our cell phones. How many times are cell right. phone updates and we have no idea what it did? You don't know what's going on. <laughs> so right. it's really important as for your side, I think, to be able to teach just better know how to still cook, even though they got this other new way now. It's, it's really important. Don't want that ever get lost. And that's so interesting to think about too, because that like natural gas thing is kind of coming into place around a lot of the places where they're trying to get rid of that out of kitchens and be more electric. Right. But okay. And I was talking to, I can't remember who I was talking to about this the other day, but it's like exactly what you're saying. What if there's a power outage mm -hmm. like, and you don't you're have a down. grass range, you don't have like the wood stone, you don't have any of that type of stuff. Like what are you cooking out of? What, like what, what's the next step for you? Like, now granted you won't have hoods working either, but you right, know right. how that <laughs> goes. <laughs> <when I'm looking. laughs> we got, we got 35 yeah. minutes before that smoke reaches <laughs> up. <Let's go. laughs> you stand at the end of the line and wave it away from us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been there. Oh, my goodness. I think we all have. So, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, I don't know how we got, how you were able to contain yourself this long, Jay, Jay Z. Uh, we haven't even talked about Halloween yet. So um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know you've been going Halloween, 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 Halloween. When do we get to Halloween? <laughs> It's coming now. <laughs> it, it Are we coming. within the 45 days? Can you start to decorate? <laughs> no, you're at 68. You're at 68. Sorry. Today is 68 days to Halloween. So, so we're so not you're, there yet. He's getting prepared though. He's got it out. Okay. So you're, so your skeleton, your skeleton's red, white, and blue, right? So that you can call it your, um, <laughs> oh, that's right. I told you that I forgot. I yeah. did that. <laughs> so, you guys got to hear this. <laughs> oh, so, oh my goodness. So yeah. So, I decorate for Halloween, yes, 100 days out. I start putting stuff out of my yard. I have a fetish for Halloween. I really do enjoy it. I think it's a cool holiday. It's 
And I think it's cool because it's not standardized. It's whatever the hell you want it to be. Halloween mm-hmm. can be, and I like that a lot about Halloween because I can do whatever I want. You know, I want to put a skeleton there. I want to make them standing this way, that way, whatever I can do. So we seriously have a festival on our street on Halloween. If I told you that there are a thousand people on this street, there are a thousand people on my street, and we have 67 houses on our street. Uh-huh. Every house decorates but two, and it is just really, really cool. I do a haunted house in my garage. The haunted house takes 43 seconds to walk through. But people wait 45 minutes in line to walk through just this haunted house. <laughs> it's just, it's an event. We've created a little festival in our neighborhood. It's a happy place, a safe place. And here we are 10 years later, we close off our block at 530 at night. You know it if you live on the street, you don't drive anywhere and no one comes down here with cars and the entire neighborhood trick-or-treats our street. Uh-huh. So I decorate early, back to that conversation. I live in a community with an HOA and the HOA sent me a violation. And in the violation, it says in bylaw 1727, you are not allowed to have (laughs) any decorations for any holiday out 45 days prior and has to be taken down 30 days after. So I'm like, well, crap, that throws me off because I have a real job. I have to work. I decorate at night or the weekends. When you look at it, there's only a few weekends. What is it like? Five Fridays till Halloween, I think, you know, and one of them is a Friday the 13th, by the way, in October, which is so cool. Um, <laughs> I get the letter. I reach out to the HOA. HOA says, it's in the bylaws, man. I'm sorry. But okay. I said, is there anything about how decorations are for a holiday? And they're like, no. So my skeletons are dressed up like a construction worker, a chef, and a, a server. <laughs> <laughs> and it's happy labor day yeah. so there's a sign in my yard you, you can't see it but there's a sign in my yard that says happy labor day i'll send you all a picture i'll send rob i'll send you a picture share it with the guys and it's 45 days out it'll change i'll take the happy labor day off i'll take the red white and blue flag down that's up and i'll put uh-huh. out halloween stuff but yeah it's my way of the loophole i guess but that's yeah. genius <laughs> yeah i mean if they've got to if they, they've got to have the bylaw then i mean you might as well you know hey, play along right and i have to decorate so behind me uh-huh. you can see i'm staging i have my uh-huh. ghost this year these are new it's ready to go out there's some white skeleton uh, white uh the the new addition is the white uh this is a white spider ooh nice and, and, yeah. yeah so I'm a little little nutty, but it's it's good fun. The, mm-hmm. the, the, all the kids love it. When you talked about kids, Luke, I love seeing a smile on some kid's face when they come up uh-huh. to the haunted house. They don't want to go through. They go through. They come out, and they're like, that was the best ever. Right. And they go back in line. And they wait another <laughs> like 45 minutes. Again. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yes, I do enjoy my Halloween I'm a fan of Halloween. Halloween's a pretty big one in our family too. I, I was talking about this before we started and my daughter, she's already, you know, like you said, we were 68 days, 68, 68, days. 68 days. But my daughter's already picked out her outfit. You know, she knows like what she's wearing to school. I think it's either the day before or the day of, I can't remember where it falls this year. And, um, so she's super excited. Um, she's already watched Hocus Pocus a couple times, which nice. thank you for reminding <laughs> me the name of the movie. I feel mm-hmm. sort of silly that I didn't know it, but my, okay. my wife's also a, she's a high school Spanish teacher. And so Dia de los Muertos is a big deal, uh, yep. within all, you know, Latin cultures and, and so forth. And so we would make like each one of her the seniors or I don't know, the upper level students, they each have to decorate a sugar school. And so she makes them from like sugar like she makes them from scratch she has like a meringue powder that she mixes into it and we form them into this we bake them in the oven so they dry out and then she takes in like these super fragile you know sugar skulls for all these kids to go and decorate they make um oh geez all 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 sorts of things so yeah i i'm a fan i I think it's a cool cool holiday as well and i like to tie into into the dia de los muertos too because i I think you know that cross-cultural piece of of, you know, celebrating, you know, celebrating the, the, the people, the, your ancestors and celebrating, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the people that have, you know, had an impact in your life. I I like that too. And being able to pull it into, into the holiday. I don't have any impact in life on it, but I do celebrate the spookiness of the season. And one of the things that I, I I don't enjoy is when his parent says, Oh, it's scary. You know, when you're, when you're teaching a young kid about scary, they're allowed to have a, a feeling 
but don't make them petrified about it. You yeah, know? So right. when someone asks, is your haunted house scary? Well, listen, every kid is different. Let them mm-hmm. decide. So when they go through and they come out and, and there's jump scares and things like that, but nothing gory. It's all simple stuff, but it's a lot of fun. And again, this celebrating the season is so cool. And this is the best season. The leaves mm-hmm. changing. Oh, yeah. Pumpkin everything now. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the food, the change in food going into the fall season is always kind of exciting for me too. I Absolutely. like that. Yeah. There was an Instagram post the other day and it was like a mom and her child and they're like, we're very anti-Halloween and we don't celebrate it, but sometimes we like to dress up and have a little fun. And then like shoots to a split screen. The guy's like, you just explained Halloween, lady. <laughs> yeah. You're celebrating Halloween. <laughs> yeah. You're literally, ex- you literally doing the yes. holiday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, this is cool, man. It was nice chatting with you for sure. Same it was, here. It was really nice to meet you. Uh, hopefully mm-hmm. one of these days we can do, you know, one of these in person or something. I think one of us needs to go on site when Jay-Z does one of his, um, five a day colorway. Oh yeah. Um, portion size, fist size. Yeah. Now that school's coming in session again, I, I usually hit the col- I usually hit the schools. I'll let you know, and I'll send you dates. Nice. You know, we can connect multiple ways. You could do an ACF meetup and come give us education on Ignite and then hit a five a day with us. However you want to work it. Okay. Come in and who knows? You never know, right? Yeah. It's all about networking, the exactly. connections you make. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. That was really cool meeting Chef Jay-Z today. Really, really awesome hearing about how hospitals are coming up with their food menus and making it so people are excited about the food instead of being like, oh man, I don't want to eat there. I'll go get something else. I'll go get Subway. And how his background really brought him up into where he is now. Right. No, he had a cool story. You know, for me, what really stuck out was just his connection with, you know, the education for kids, um, his, you know, just kind of need to be involved in that, that part of the world. Like I, that really, that really hit home with me. Um, I hope to, gosh, I, I hope to do something like that. You know, like it's like, it, there was, that was one of those moments for me where it was like, you know, when I grow up someday, I want to do that. And I, I, I want to be able to have that kind of an impact on, on youth and, and kids about food, right? Something that I'm passionate about. Yeah. And, you know, he, each one of, he did many different things within the hospitality industry between sales and traditional cooking and things like that. And everything kind of led to the next thing. You know, everything was about networking and know your network and pr- expand your network. And, you know, it's people, cooks are going to take care of other cooks. And, you know, we're all, as long as you got that network and it's, it's something, something cool. And then, you know, finding out about his little passion for Halloween and how <laughs> crazy they get for Halloween. I think that's really fun. And his little stepping stone and be able to get any of the decorations up early. <laughs> <laughs> Work the system, baby. Yeah. Stick it to the HOA, Jay-Z. Yeah. You got this. <laughs> okay. We got to, we got to wrap. We got to say something to, to finish this. What, how are we going to do it? If we're not spinning around. Just, just say like, and subscribe, Ryan. You do it really good. Don't forget to like and subscribe our Restaurant 360. Wait, damn it. 360. <laughs> oh, my. It's the wrong company altogether. I think I have COVID. <laughs> All right. Try again. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe at Culinary 365. Paul. God damn it. <laughs> All right. Hey, I got it. Okay. Come on, Dad. Take us home. Don't forget to like and subscribe our Culinary 360 podcast. Yes. Yes.